dwarfed by the vastness of the softly turfed plateau which was the weeping waste. In place of eternal rains, the two horsemen drove their hard-pressed steeds through the drizzle. A shivering desert warrior, huddled against the weather, saw them come towards him. He stared through the rain, trying to make out details of the riders, then wheeled his stocky pony and rode swiftly back in the direction he had come. Within minutes he had reached a larger group of warriors, attired like himself in furs and tasseled iron helmets. They carried short bone bows and quivers of long arrows fletched with hawk feathers. There were curved scimitars at their sides. He exchanged a few words with his fellows and soon they were all lashing their horses towards the two riders. How much further lies the camp of Terra and Gashtek, Moonglum? Elric's words were breathless, for both men had ridden for a day without halt. Not much further, Elric. We should be... Now look. Moonglum pointed ahead. About ten riders came swiftly towards them. Desert barbarians, the Flamebringers men, prepare for a fight. They won't waste time parleying. Stormbringer scraped from the scabbard, and the heavy blade seemed to aid Elric's wrist as he raised it, so that it felt almost weightless. Moonglum drew both his swords, holding the short one with the same hand with which he grasped his horse's reins. The eastern warriors spread out in a half-circle as they rode down on the companions, yelling wild war shouts. Elric reared his mount to a savage standstill and met the first rider with Stormbringer's point full in the man's throat. There was a stink like brimstone as it pierced flesh, and the warrior drew a ghastly choking breath as he died, his eyes staring out in full realisation of his terrible fate, for Stormbringer drank souls as well as blood. Elric cut savagely at another desert man, lopping off his sword arm and splitting his, crusted, crust, his crested helm and the skull beneath. Rain and sweat ran down his white, taut features into his glowing crimson eyes. But he blinked it aside, half fell in his saddle as he turned to defend himself against another howling scimitar, parried the sweep, slid his own rune blade down its length, turned the blade with a movement of his wrist and disarmed the warrior. And then he plunged his sword into the man's heart, and the desert warrior yelled like a wolf at the moon. A long, baying shout before Stormbringer took his soul. Elric's face was twisted in self-loathing as he fought intently with superhuman strength. Moonglum stayed clear of the albino sword, for he knew its liking for the taking of lives of Elric's friends. Soon only one opponent was left. Elric disarmed him and had to hold his own greedy sword back from the man's throat. Reconciled to the horror of his death, the man said something in a guttural language which Elric half recognised. He searched his memory and realised that it was a language close to one of the many ancient tongues which as a sorcerer he had been required to learn years before. He said in the same language, Thou art one of the warriors of Terran Gashtek, the Flamebringer. That is true. And you must be the white-faced evil one of legends. I beg you to slay me with a cleaner weapon than that which you hold. Well, I do not wish to kill thee at all. We were coming hence to join Terran Gashtek. Take us to him. The man nodded hastily and clambered back on his horse. Who are you that speaks the high tongue of our people? I am called Elric of Malnibane. Dost thou know the name? The warrior shook his head. No, but the high tongue has not been spoken for generations, save by shamans. Yet, you're no shaman. But by your dress, you seem a warrior. We are both mercenaries, but speak no more. I'll explain the rest to thy leader. They left a jackal's feast behind them and followed the quaking Easterner in the direction he led them. Fairly soon, the low-lying smoke of many campfires could be observed, 
and at length they saw the sprawling camp of the barbarian warlord's mighty army. The camp encompassed over a mile of the great plateau. The barbarians had erected skin tents on rounded frames, and the camp had the aspect of a large primitive town. Roughly in the centre was a much larger construction, decorated with a motley assortment of gaudy silks and brocades. Moonglum said in a western tongue, That must be Tehran Gashtek's dwelling. See, he has covered it, half-cured hides with a score of eastern battle flags. His face grew grimmer as he noted the torn standard of Eshmir, the lion flag of Okara, and the blood-soaked penance of sorrowing Chang Shai. The captured warrior led them through the squatting ranks of barbarians who stared at them impassively and muttered to one another. Outside Tehran Gashtek's tasteless dwelling was his great war lance decorated with more trophies and his conquests, the skulls and bones of eastern princes and kings. Auric said, Such a one as this must not be allowed to destroy the reborn civilization of the young kingdoms. Young kingdoms are resilient, remarked Moonglum, but it is when they are old that they fall, and it is often Tehran Gashtek's kind that tear them down. And while I live, he shall not destroy Karlark, nor reach as far as Bakshan. Moonglum said, though in my opinion he'd be welcome to Ned Sakor. The city of beggars deserves such visitors as the Flamebringer. If we fail Elric, only the sea will stop him. And perhaps not that. With Divim Slorm's aid, we will stop him. Let us hope Karlak's messenger finds my kinsman soon. If he does not, we shall be hard put to fight off half a million warriors, my friend. The barbarian shouted, O oh, conqueror, mighty flamebringer, there are men here who wish to speak with you. A slurred voice snarled, Bring him in. They entered the badly smelling tent, which was lighted by a fire flickering in a circle of stones. A gaunt man, carelessly dressed in bright captured clothing, lounged on a wooden bench. There were several women in the tent, one of whom poured wine into a heavy golden goblet, which he held out. Tehran Gashtek pushed the woman aside, knocking her sprawling and regarding the newcomers. His face was almost as fleshless as the skulls hanging outside his tent. His cheeks were sunken, and his slanting eyes narrow beneath thick brows. Who are these? The Lord, I know not, but between them they slew ten of our men and would have slain me. You deserve no more than death if you let yourself be disarmed. Get out and find a new sword quickly, or I'll let the shamans have the vitals for divination. The man slunk away. Tehran Gashtek seated himself upon the bench once more. So you slew ten of my bloodletters, did you? Come here to boast to me about it. What's the explanation? We but defended ourselves against your warriors. We sought no quarrel with them. Elric now spoke the cruder tongue as best he could. You defended your lives fairly well, I grant you. We reckon three soft-living house-dwellers to one of us. You're a westerner, I can tell that, though your silent friend has the face of an elf where I... Have you come from the east or the west? The west, Elric said. We are free-travelling warriors, hiring our swords to those who will pay or... Promise us good booty. You're all western warriors as skillful as you. Tehran Gashtek could not hide his sudden realisation that he might have underestimated the men he hoped to conquer. We are a little better than most, lied Moonglum, but not much. And what of sorcery? Is there much strong magic here? No, said Alric. The art has been lost to most. The barbarian's thin mouth twisted in a grin, half of relief and half of triumph. He nodded his head, reached into his gaudy silks and 
produced a small black and white bound cat. He began to stroke its back. It wriggled, but could do no more than hiss at its captor. Then we need not worry, he said. Now, why did you come here? I could have you tortured for days for what you did. Slaying ten of my best outriders. Well, we recognise the chance of enriching ourselves by aiding you, Lord Flamebringer, said Elric. Could show you the richest towns, lead you to ill-defended cities that would take little time to fall. Will you enlist us? I've need of men such as you true enough. I'll enlist you readily, but mark this. I'll not trust you until you've proved loyal to me. Find yourselves quarters now and come to the feast tonight. There I'll be able to show you something of the power I hold. The power which will smash the strength of the West and lay it waste for ten thousand miles. Thank you, said Ulrich. I'll look forward to tonight. They left the tent and wandered through the haphazard collection of tents and cooking fires, wagons and animals. There seemed little food, but wine was in abundance, and the taut, hungry stomachs of the barbarians were placated with that. They stopped a warrior and told him of Turan Gashtek's orders to them. The warrior sullenly led them to a tent. Here was shared by three of the men you slew. It is yours by right of battle, as are the weapons and booty inside. We're richer already, grinned Elric with feigned delight. In the privacy of the tent, which was less clean than Turan Gashtek's, they debated. I feel uncommonly uncomfortable, said Moonglum, surrounded by this treacherous horde, and every time I think of what they made of Eshmir, I itch to slay more of them. What now? We can do nothing now. Let us wait until tonight and see what develops. Elric sighed. Our task seems impossible. I've never seen so great a horde as this. They are invincible as they are, said Moonglum. Even without Drinage Barra's sorcery to tumble down the walls of cities, no single nation could withstand them. And with the western nations squabbling among themselves, they could never unite in time. Civilization itself is threatened. Let us pray for inspiration. Your dark gods are at least sophisticated, Elric. We must hope that they'll resent the barbarians' intrusion as much as we do. They play strange games with their human pawns, Elric replied. Who knows what they plan? Turan Gashtek's smoke wreath's tent had been further lighted by rush torches when Elric and Moonglum swaggered in, and the feast, consisting primarily of wine, was already in progress. Welcome, my friends, shouted the flamebringer, waving his goblet. These are my captains. Come join them. Elric had never before seen such an evil-looking group of barbarians. They were all half-drunk, and like their leader, had draped a variety of looted articles of clothing about themselves. But their swords were their own. Room was made on one of the benches, and they accepted wine, which they drank sparingly. Bring in our slave, yelled Turan Gashtek. Bring in Drinage Bara, our pet sorcerer. Before him on the table lay the bound and struggling cat and beside it an iron blade. Grinning warriors dragged a morose-faced man close to the fire and forced him to kneel before the barbarian chief. He was a lean man, and he glowered at Turan Gashtek and the little cat, and his eyes saw the iron blade and his gaze faltered. What do you want with me now? He said sullenly. Is that any way to address your master spellmaker? Still no matter. We have guests to entertain. Men who have promised to lead us to fat merchant cities. We require you to do a few minor tricks for them. 
I'm no petty sorcerer. You cannot ask this of one of the greatest conjurers in the world. We do not ask, we order. Come make the evening lively. What do you need for your magic making? A few slaves? The blood of virgins? We'll arrange it. I am no mumbling shaman. I need no such trappings. Suddenly the sorcerer saw Elric. The albino felt the man's powerful mind tentatively probing his own. He had been recognised as a fellow sorcerer. Would Strinage Bara betray him? Elric was tense, waiting to be denounced. He leaned back in his chair and as he did so made a sign with his hand which would be recognised by western sorcerers. Would the Easterner know it? He did, and for a moment he faltered, glancing at the barbarian leader. Then he turned away and began to make new passes in the air, muttering to himself. The beholders gasped as a cloud of golden smoke formed near the roof and began to metamorphose into the shape of a great horse bearing a rider which recognised as Turan Gashtek. The barbarian leader leaned forward, glaring at the image. What's this? A map showing great land areas and seas seemed to unroll beneath the horse's hooves. The western lands, cried Drinage Barra. I make a prophecy. And what is it? The ghostly horse began to trample the map. It split and flew into a thousand smoky pieces. Then the image of the horseman faded also into fragments. Thus will the mighty flame-bringer rend the bountiful nations of the west, shouted Drinage Barra. The barbarians cheered exultantly, but Alric smiled thinly. The eastern wizard was mocking Turan Gashtek and his men. The smoke formed into a golden globe which seemed to blaze and vanish. Turan Gashtek laughed. A good trick, magic maker, and a true prophecy. You've done your work well. Take him back to his kennel. As Drinage Barra was dragged away, he glanced questioningly at Elric, but said nothing. Later that night, as the barbarians drank themselves into a stupor, Elric and Moonglum slipped out of the tent and made their way to the place where Drinage Barra was imprisoned. They reached the small hut and saw that a warrior stood guard at the entrance. Moonglum produced a skin of wine and, pretending drunkenness, staggered toward the man. Eric stayed where he was. "'What do you want, Outlander?' growled the guard. "'Nothing, my friend. We're trying to get back to our own tent, is all. Do you know where it is?' "'Well, how should I know?' Drew, how should you know? Have some wine, it's good. From Terran Gashtek's own supply. The man extended a hand. Let's have it. Moonglum took a swig of the wine. No, I've changed my mind. It's too good to waste on common warriors. Is that so? The warrior took several paces towards Moonglum. We'll find out, won't we? Maybe we'll mix some of your blood with it to give it flavour, my little friend. Moonglum backed away. The warrior followed. Elric ran softly towards the tent and ducked into it to find Drinage Barra, wrists bound, lying on a pile of uncured hides. The sorcerer looked up. You. What do you want? We've come to aid you, Drinage Barra. <laughs> aid me? But why? You're no friend of mine. What would you gain? You risk too much. Well, as a fellow sorcerer, I thought I'd help you, Elric said. I thought you were that, but in my land, sorcerers are not so friendly to one another. The opposite, in fact. I'll tell you the truth. We need your aid to halt the barbarians' bloody progress. We have a common enemy. If we can help you regain your soul, will you help? Help, of course. All I do is plan the way I'll avenge myself. 
But for my sake, be careful. If he suspects that you're here to aid me, he'll slay the cat and slay us too. We'll try to bring the cat to you. Will that be what you need? Yes, we must exchange blood to the cat and I, and my soul will then pass back into my own body. Very well, I'll try to. Arik turned, hearing voices outside. What's that? The sorcerer replied fearfully. It must be Terran Gashtek. He comes every night to taunt me. Where's the guard? The barbarian's harsh voice came closer as he entered the little tent. He saw Alric standing above the sorcerer. His eyes were puzzled and weary. What are you doing here, Westerner? What have you done with the guard? Guard? said Ulrich. But I saw no guard. I was looking for my own tent and heard this cur cry out, so I entered. I was curious anyway to see such a great sorcerer, clad in filthy rags and bound so. Turan Gashtek scowled. Any more of such unweary curiosity, my friend, and you'll be discovering what your own heart looks like. And get thee hence. We ride on in the morning. Alric pretended to flinch and stumbled hurriedly from the tent. A lone man in the livery of an official messenger of Carlark goaded his horse southwards. The mount galloped over the crest of a hill and the messenger saw a village ahead. Hurriedly he rode into it, shouting at the first man he saw. Quickly tell me! Know you what of Divim Slorm and his Imririan mercenaries? Have they passed this way? Aye, a week ago. They went towards Rignarium by Jadmar's border to offer their sources to the Vilmirian pretender. Were they mounted or on foot? Both? Thanks, friends, cried the messenger behind him, and galloped out of the village in the direction of Rignarium. The messenger from Karlark rode through the night rode along a recently made trail. A large force had passed this way. He prayed that it had been Divim Slorm and his Imridian warriors. In the sweet-smelling garden city of Karlark, the atmosphere was tense as the citizens waited for news they knew they could not expect for some time. They were relying on both Elric and on the messenger. If only one was successful, then there would be no hope for them. Both had to be successful. Both. 